Good afternoon, good morning, um, whatever time it is, um, wherever you are in the world. Um, let me welcome you along to uh, this panel in the electoral integrity of the EEI, e e the IEIP conference. I always get that all mixed up now. Um, we've got a panel um, here this afternoon on electoral finance or, and accountability. We're going to commence with um, Sam Power, who's going to be talking to us um, on a joint authored paper with Kate Domit and Andrew Barclay at University of Sheffield um, about understanding the, the modern election campaign, analysing campaign eras through financial transparency disclosures, um, what seems to be a, a, an absolutely fascinating um, topic. Um, Sam, take it away. Bad. Thanks very much, uh, Alistair. I'll just um, share my screen um, and... Okay, can you all see it? Bad. Um, right, so what I wanted to do today was to, um, <clears throat> yeah, talk about a project that I've been working on with uh, various people, inclusive of Kate and Andrew from the University of Sheffield and Amber, um, from Tactical Tech. Um, and what we've done is gone through the financial trans transparency disclosures at the 2019 UK general election. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as the presentation goes on. But um, what we've done is just gone through the spending returns effectively that were submitted at the UK general election. We spent a long time coding them. And I've actually been spending this year as a, a, as a senior fellow of the Electoral Integrity Project, um, looking at automating that process. Um, so using machine learning and natural language processing to do it to a wider range of disclosures. Um, which again, I'll talk about a little bit later, um, mainly in, as, a, as a court cry for help more than anything else. Um, and then uh, I, I suppose the, the third thing to mention is that out of this project in particular, we've been publishing a, a, a few different papers um, and there's a number of different ways in which I thought about what I could present here in particular. And what I've gone with is something that we're not quite sure about um, and something that we're not quite sure if we've, that we've got, if it works, frankly. So to use this as a workshop in the truest sense and to kind of workshop the idea that we have. Um, we've, 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 we've published, uh, we have published one of the papers out of this project, which is in representation. Um, that is on an element of these disclosures. Um, and we've also got another uh, another paper under review at, at present. And I thought rather than present the, the finished paper or the one under review, I very much treat this as a workshop more than anything else of, um, of perhaps a bad idea, perhaps a good idea, perhaps a middling idea that needs punching up. Um, so, so any thoughts, very, very welcome either after this session, um, so, sorry, during this session or, uh, you know, answers on a postcard or by email um, afterwards. So this particular paper, what we're trying to think about is um, what we can know about the modern campaign, what we can know about modern campaigning through looking at these financial transparency um, disclosures. And our motivation is based on, I suppose, some kind of triangulation of these three uh, statements that we've plucked out. The first is uh, not by the actual Aristotle, it's, uh, it's, by, it's by a company called Aristotle. This was the actual Aristotle who'd be incredibly forward thinking. Um, but what they suggest is that a campaign strategy that is not data driven is likely to fall behind. The second um, is from, uh, from, from Shoshana Zubov, who perhaps problematizing this, this change in uh, changing nature, not not necessarily of campaigning, but of, uh, of the modern world and the way that the internet is moving, is a problem for democracy. That democracy is on the ropes in the UK and the US in, in no small measure because of the operations of surveillance capitalism. And then the third is an academic here in the UK, Phil Cowley, who suggests that there is an inverse relationship between the importance of any election campaign technique and the amount of media coverage devoted to it. So we've got a full range, I would suggest, of, uh, of thoughts here from you need to engage with data and the new campaign uh, and the new campaign infrastructure 
to that campaign infrastructure is incredibly worrying um, to, well, perhaps it's not all that important at all, or this media coverage devoted to new campaign techniques is perhaps uh, mis guided. And what we wanted to know was not necessarily whether this was true or not, but what was going on in, uh, in modern election campaigning and how we could possibly work that out. So uh, the literature that we're, that we're engaged with um, is the literature on modern election campaigns. So that parties engage in what would be called data-driven campaigning, um, which is a contested term, but uh, my, my colleague Kate Domit or co-author Kate Domit has got a fantastic um, paper out which really looks at every element of uh, what data-driven campaigning may or may not be and comes up with a pretty neat definition of it. But that parties and candidates engage in data-driven campaigning is well established. Um, and another thing that we know is that it's certainly more efficient and cheaper than, mod uh, the, the, than, than traditional methods. There's an open debate about whether it equalizes or normalizes party competition. That is to say, does it create space for new and challenger and insurgent parties and campaigns to have more of an impact? Or does it benefit the larger, more resourced campaigns? Uh, most likely what it does is that it first equalizes and creates this space, but then normalizes campaigns as the establishment see the value of online campaigning. And finally, where we base our research is within the four eras of campaign practice literature. That um, the, the, the campaigning has moved from the first to the second to the third to the fourth literature. And where we're most aligned with is less that campaigns move in a kind of teleological, I suppose, sense from one to the next and, uh, and one displaces the other, but rather that new campaign practices supplement uh, but don't replace existing existing ones. So a quick sort of whistle-stop tour between, through that literature of political campaigns. Phase one, um, generally considered to be between 1850 and 1960 in places like the UK and the USA, is seen as partisan-centred, where large party memberships with e within an ethos of civic participation really drove campaigns forward. So the large, the, the primary means of campaigning here were meetings and rallies, canvassing and merchandise, and leaflets and posters. These are what, it, what is indicative of phase one. Um, phase two is commonly understood as mass-centered, and this is where we see the advent of new technology, or TV, uh, I suppose, which changed campaign practice. So we saw the use of party election broadcasts, or TV adverts, where that is allowed, um, polling, an increase of polling, billboards to appeal to a wider range of people, external design companies, and paid direct mail. We then have phase three, which was understood as target group centered campaigning, very much defined by the nascent use of the internet, where Bill Clinton laid claim to this virtual terra nova after his staff uploaded a series of basic text files with bi biographical information for voters to browse. Um, when I say nascent, I really do mean nascent in that instance. But what we might understand the campaign tools here as was a use of websites, banner ads, and email, phone banking, consultants, and things like focus groups. And then the argument is that we end up in phase four, uh, which is about 2008 to present, what we would understood as individual centered. And this is where social media platforms become the new battleground and data is the weapon of choice, where we have online and social media advertising as a campaign tool, mobile apps and message testing, databases and data analytics. And what we wanted to do was work out in 2019 what the modern campaign in the UK looked like and where it fell within these phases. Um, so how did we do this? Well, our approach was to look at the transparency disclosures, look at the spending at the election. Most countries in the world have disclosure regimes. 
but transparency varies wildly. What we do know is that the UK is one of the models of best practice in this area in terms of its searchable database. Um, and it's one of the few countries in the world where we, we, where we can view actual invoices. If you spend over 200 pounds at an election in the UK, you have to submit a receipt or an invoice saying exactly what it was that you spent money on there. So our case study was the UK parliamentary general election and our research question, which I'm not quite sure we've worded correctly. So any, any, better, uh, any, any better semantics that anyone can come up with, please do, please do let me know. How and why are different campaign eras blended by modern campaigns? So uh, what was our method? Well, as I've suggested, election spending in the UK is tightly regulated. The, the upper limit at an election of the party can spend is 19.5 million pounds, although it's in reality a bit lower than that. Candidates can spend, uh, spend, spend much less than that in constituencies, but those limits vary. As I've suggested, all spending must be reported to the Electoral Commission. And if it's over 200 pounds, receipts and invoices must be made available as are made available as PDFs on the Electoral Commission website. Um, so must be made available to the Electoral Commission. And this spending has to be recorded under one of 10 categories. But these categories aren't very good, frankly, or my, 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 our position is that they're not very good. So you might have, or you have advertising as one of the categories. Doesn't really tell you whether that's multi social media advertising, online advertising, billboard advertising, whatever it might be. Overheads and general administration is another. Very broad categories that don't give you all that much detail. So in this database for the 2019 general election, there are 22,720 separate items of spend, inclusive of 6,391 invoices. That makes a total of just over 50 million pounds spent at the election. And what we did is analyzed uh, because, you know, we, we, we needed to have some system of sifting. We actually analyzed just, and I'm uh, using, using that in some pretty significant italics there, just 5,770 invoices every invoice or supplier where there is a cumulative spend of over £1,000, which came to a total spend of nearly £50 million, so £49.9 million. Pounds. So we felt like we covered a reasonable amount and enough of the bases um, there to, to get a good picture of spend. So what we did is that we coded these invoices. There was four of us, as suggest in the, uh, as is suggested, um, and we initially took small samples of 200 and inductively coded the activity to develop a list of categories, which we then cross-referenced against the literature that I gave you a whistle-stop tour of then. So we effectively recategorized the database based on what was on the invoice. The ca these categories were then applied to a second sample of about 200 invoices again. A consistency of approach between us as a team was checked. Differences were discussed when we had slightly different categorizations and new codes were added. And we did this as an iterative process until we ended up with 50 categories with nine main codes and 41 subcodes. Once we had that, we double coded the entire database based against this. So everyone, so two people in the research team will have looked at all 5,770 of the invoices. We then did further robustness tests, um, which includes checking 20% of invoices per person, measured it against the Cohen's Kappa score, which is, uh, which is the score that you look at when you're doing this kind of activity. And we found that we had a high internal reliability of coding. Um, and then we assigned each of the categories to a campaign era via that extensive literature review that I outlined in the in the first in the first part of this talk. Um, and what we decided on was to go with the wider adoption as opposed to the first use. So I'm sure that poll, polls have happened way back to perhaps Aristotle's time. But what we did is when that was widely adopted as a campaign practice, um, what we were able to do is assign 86. 6.2% of our categories to one of our substantive categories, but 13.8% were coded as completely unclear. And it's that 13.8% that our paper and representation is about. But we then use the 86.2% to answer 
this how and why question about how and why parties are blending campaign techniques. Um, here's just a quick example of some of the unclear invoices that we saw. One has very helpfully got a post-it note over the description of the service. One is very blurry, so you can't read what the service is. Um, one is redacted to within an inch of its life. And this one in the bottom left here by Hanbury Strategy is for the provision of services. So we're not entirely sure what that is for. Um, and this is our overall data. Okay, so our codes um, over the nine main codes, advertising and press campaign materials, campaign activity, etc., with our subcodes, which we think better outline exactly what, was, what money was spent on at the 2019 general election. So answering the how, the first thing that we can see is that parties spend a lot more money in the first two phases of campaign activity, so your traditional campaign activity, than the latter phases. Only about seven million pounds, oh, sorry, nine million pounds is spent on phase four, whereas nearly 30 million pounds or over 30 million pounds is spent on phases one and two and significantly less on phase three. And yet about seven million pounds uh, that was spent at the uh, general election, it's unclear from the invoices what that was spent on, hence the paper in representation. We can also see that there is significant variation between what parties spend their money on. So we can see that the Greens spend, um, sp spend quite a lot on phase four and phase one, but the SNP spend significantly more on phase one as a proportion of their spend than other parties. Um, so we can see that political parties are actually using their money differently. So it's not just that we see that we see this money flowing in one direction and we see everyone moving to phase four, but actually different parties campaign differently. We can also see within phase variation. So if you look at party spend over 10% by era and phase, every time a party spent over 10% of their budget, then we can see that different parties again campaign differently. So the Green Party spend all of their phase four spend, as it were, on social media adverts, whereas the Conservative Party split the difference between social media adverts and online adverts. The Liberal Democrats spend loads on paid leaflet delivery as compared to other services in phase two. So we can see some pretty significant um, difference in the way in which parties are spend their, spending their money, not just by phase, but actually within phases as well. So just to say, use campaign spending as a, as a sort of homogenous block is perhaps simplifying it somewhat. So we can see how parties are spending their money. Answering the why is slightly more complex. Um, there you go. Um, what we did here to answer the why question is just to um, look in the literature at different reasons that uh, are outlined as the literature um, as to the, why parties adopt new campaign practices. And we came up with three different things. So we came up with that there, there are specific reasons due to party characteristics, there are specific reasons due to party resources, and there are specific reasons during, due to party competition. You'll have to forgive me, uh, the person that sometimes walks our dog just walked past the window and our dog got very excited. Um, so due to party characteristics, we based on things like ideology of the party, an exogenous shock, so um, whether there was a pre pretty significant swing in um, party votes between 2015 and 2017, an endogenous shock, so whether there is a leadership change, party age and party size, resource as it related to income and expenditure, staffing and number of party members and supporters, um, and uh, finally, um, uh, party competition. Um, and that relates to the overall seats that a party had, competitive seats that a party fought in at the constituency level, candidates standing and time in government. So if a party had been in government for a long time or had been in government for an amount of time over the last 50, uh, 50 years. And this is just some descriptive statistics of, um, of, of, of what that is summarised as. So the membership, the staff, the income of the party, uh, 2017 seats and uh, the share of the vote um, at, at the last general election. We also plugged in a underperformance as, as compared with 
um, the, 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 the suggested polling in 2019 um, to, to, or in 2017 to capture an extra level of that, of that shock. Um, so we, we plugged this into a Poisson regression, um, which is uh, Andrew Barkley, who is our who is our super quants guy, reliably informs me is the best way to analyze this data because we have a lot of zero values. Um, and I'm not going to go through this whole table because we're probably going to take the bivariate um, uh, regressions out anyway. But if we look at the multivariate regression for phase four, um, then we can see some slightly fuzzy but interesting um, turn uh, uh, results. What we're looking for is um, it is, is distance from the number one, essentially. Um, and what we can see, which that means is that uh, in, in three instances, we can see that 0.71 in the top right with three stars suggests that less well-resourced parties were more likely to engage and um, indulge in phase four campaigning. We can then see um, the electoral shock variable, 2.85. That means that political parties that had received a significant shock, um, external uh, external shock, so, um, so, so that had performed badly at the last election, were more likely to engage in, um, in phase four campaigning. And then finally, ideology. 1.84 means that more right-wing parties are, uh, right, the, the, the right-wing parties are more likely to engage in that campaigning as well. And we also see some interesting things in phase one, phase two, and phase three. Um, but these results are quite fuzzy, and we can bring that out in this graph here. If we look at, um, if we look particularly at phase one and phase three, we don't really see all that much in the effects whatsoever. What we want is distance from that middle line there. Um, we can see some differences in phase two. Um, so party strength might make ha, has some has some effect. The stronger the party, um, ideology again, the more right wing has some effect. And um, if you've if you've had faced an electoral shock, that has some effect. Phase four again, but these effects are quite marginal, even as related to ideology and external shock, so electoral shock. So we are just we, th these results are quite fuzzy in terms of the regressions that we get. So the answering the how is easy. The answering the why is slightly more complicated. And this is where I'll end up with um, just some tentative conclusions, I suppose. So the first is that there's no evidence that parties are abandoning established campaign practice, no evidence whatsoever that that's the case. In fact, they are engaging with it or at least spending far more money on that than other campaign activity. Also pretty significant evidence that parties campaign differently and therefore have different priorities. In terms of the why, the evidence that we currently have in this paper suggests that um, there's a normalization in terms of party strength. So if you've, if you've got a strong party, an established party, that means that you're quite likely to engage in fourth era campaigning, but an equalization in terms of party resource. So poorer parties um, perhaps are more likely to engage in this phase four campaigning, perhaps because it's cheaper. But there's a lot of null findings here, which suggests that maybe big spenders just crowd, crowd everything out. And the way that I like to think of it is resource profligacy versus resource efficiency. Um, so perhaps the, 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 the poorer parties um, have to spend their money a little bit more wisely and be a bit more efficient with the way that they're spending it. Um, so really do focus on specific campaign activities because they don't have much money. Whereas your rich parties, your Labour Party and your Conservative Party, just sort of throw money at a wall and throw money at everything just to see what works. Because frankly, they've got the money to spend. So resource profligacy versus resource efficiency is perhaps a way to understand the modern campaign, particularly in the UK. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll conclude on my, I suppose, cry for help. This is an ongoing project. As I mentioned, I'm a senior fellow at the Electoral Integrity Project looking at this. And we do have funding. We have about £200,000 from the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council to automate this process. So what we're going to do is use this data that we've got that I presented here as a training set to then go through the whole Electoral Commission database, which spans back to the year 2000, which will allow us to do some more longitudinal analysis to look at change over time. And in terms of public policy, what we want to do is create a tool 
um, for the Electoral Commission to use. Um, we, we will show them it when we have it, but a, a natural language processing tool um, for the Electoral Commission to use, um, which we think will aid with compliance. So where you see these blurry invoices that are unclear, if you have a supervised uh, machine learning tool or natural language processing tool, then that will act as a red flag and flag up um, non-compliance such that the Electoral Commission can get um, can, can get in touch with them. And we want to build this out to be comparative. So we want to look for similarly permissive political finance regimes where something like this might be possible and see if this machine learning and language processing tool is available there. So if you've got any ideas on that, please do get in touch. I'm going to stop now um, just as the dog is barking at somebody else out the window. Right, thanks, Sam. Um, we've, we've got a tradition in uh, the UK of uh, dogs at polling stations, so we've, we've now established dogs at, at, at conferences, I feel. Um, I think I should shout out for the cats that, that wander across everybody's um, keyboards as, as well in that regard. Okay, thanks, Sam. Um, absolutely fascinating stuff. Um, morning EIP project. What an honor to be here, especially on American Independence Day, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you more about my research topic, which is Zelensky's networked diplomacy, exploring its influence on democracy and electoral processes in Ukraine. Let me start by saying that this research is predicated upon the work I did in my doctoral dissertation, which focused on Zelensky's public diplomacy discourse. I utilized linguistic inquiry and word count, Luke 22, as well as a leadership trait analysis via Profiler Plus to examine his psychometric traits as demonstrated through public diplomacy. So after those findings and discussion, I'm left with this understanding, um, a one-sided understanding of this man, Vladimir Zelensky, and his public diplomacy discourse in Ukraine. So as I started my research into electoral integrity and networked public diplomacy, it was important to take a look at the other side and that being um, civilian population and civilian sentiment. And do these two sides, do they meet? Is there a correlation? So let me explain that what I have done for this research is a reanalysis. I took the original studies findings on Zelensky, and then I created new, a new approach, um, a novel approach to reanalyze those findings through a phenomenological inquiry. Let me tell you a little bit more about that, but first, some background on the Ukrainian conflict. Indeed, Ukraine's political landscape and the role of President Zelensky's leadership provides a rich context for understanding how personal leadership traits, cultural dynamics, and geopolitical challenges intersect to shape a nation's trajectory. In light of the Russian invasion and the ongoing Russo-Ukrainian war, now 18 months in existence, the resulting complexities and understanding these complexities is more important than ever. This research underlines the importance of strong and capable leadership in navigating geopolitical crises, especially ambiguous gray zone security concerns. This includes state sovereignty and, as is the subject of this workshop, electoral integrity and democracy. So to understand in the light of, of the war and Zelensky's leadership, Let's understand that the findings from the previous study that were referenced is that Zelensky is characterized by a consultative dial. This is a Margaret Herman trait analysis finding according to her paradigm. Consultative style means a strategic mindset and a high level of self-confidence, which has played a critical role in shaping Ukraine's response to the invasion. Zelensky uses a specious amount of anger in his rhetoric to inspire resistance. And this aligns with the broader findings of the research showing there's a correlation between a proactive mindset and the ability to influence others. At the same time, the study reveals that Zelensky's leadership is not solely responsible for Ukraine's resilience. The public sentiment and behavioral traits identified in the research include a pronounced backing for Ukraine's independence, as well as a positive perception of the nation's path and trajectory, and a belief in um, Ukrainians' ability to influence events. This contributes to ongoing resistance. In both phases of the research, I defer to Clausewitz, the author of On War and a Study of Modern Warcraft, who explains there's a perfect trinity between leadership, uh, military, and civilian might. 
and determination, and these work together in a triangle to, to promote the, um, the resistance that I've spoken about or the understanding the state belief, nationalism, and other ways citizens identify with state, um, the state brand, if you will. So looking at network diplomacy, there are some notable findings where we see that by utilizing digital platforms, Zelensky is able to foster direct communication and collaboration with both domestic and international audiences. This has created a transparent and inclusive diplomatic environment. These digital interactions play a crucial role in promoting electoral integrity and state sovereignty, thereby bolstering Ukraine's standing in the international community, as well as reinforcing belief and national identity. However, research, as always, is limited, and understanding Zelensky's leadership and its impact on Ukraine's domestic and international politics is still constrained. I would argue there's need for further research for a more comprehensive perspective, and that could be quite beneficial. My hope is that this research offers some valuable insights into Ukraine's political dynamics, its leadership, the role of network diplomacy, especially at the time of crisis, and illuminates the complex interplay of various factors from leadership style to public sentiment. Let me explain a bit about using data for a reanalysis. In the methodology, the research is considered a mixed methods with that quantitative piece coming in the first phase and a blended qualitative analysis here in the second phase by focusing on Zelensky's speeches from the time he took office May 2019 through May 2023. The analyses additionally took public survey data to reconcile what was concluded initially about Zelensky's leadership and to match it up against public sentiment. So understanding that leadership trait analyses was used to determine Zelensky's leadership traits. And these traits were scored against Schaefer and Lambert's psychological characteristics of leaders or psych CL study of 2022. This nested Zelensky in a cohort of 113 other world leaders. So understanding this, and moving into the second phase, that's qualitative reanalyses. This is a data triangulation used to cross-check and corroborate the study's findings. So using rating group UA survey data in that initial study, this hybrid and purpose, um, purposive sampling of, of survey data was used to examine these significant periods and understand the primary analytical framework is a IPA or a phenomenological inquiry and the examination of other global leaders, again, putting Zelensky in a cohort and then understanding the, the match between leadership and, and followership. So in the sentiment analysis of the surveys that were examined for, for a phenomenological inquiry, it shows Ukrainians are quite optimistic about their future. They support President Zelensky at almost a 90% support rate. They have a belief in Ukraine's ability to win the war. They have a belief in significant success in the future, and they unanimously agree that the future will be better than the past. So this is a quick overview of what I researched and wanted to share today with the Electoral Integrity Project. Thank you.